Hi Year 8, welcome back to your next lesson with me, Miss Thika. This is going to be your last YouTube lesson um, with me because this lesson's going to be slightly longer. So if you want to do this in two parts, you could do the uh, first part this week um, and then the second part next week if you wanted to. Um, and at the end of the lesson, I'm also going to show you um, some other good YouTube videos that you can watch if you um, find the topic of World War One quite interesting, you want to watch some more um, videos on that. So this lesson will take a little bit longer um, than normal, hence why I'm not doing another YouTube lesson next week. But I will make a quiz um, on Teams and I'll send that quiz to your teachers as well um, so they can set that. So that'll be your work for next week. Um, so today we're thinking about why some women uh, gained the right to vote in 1918. We're going to be looking at the role of women in World War One and thinking about the different reasons as to why women were awarded, or some women were awarded the vote in 1918, and thinking about the most important reason for that. So the first thing I want you to do is just pause me now and think about all of the different things we've been looking at over the past few weeks in terms of women through history, attitudes towards women through time, and I want you to bullet point as many different reasons as you can possibly think of um, as to why women were denied the right to vote for so long. So pause me now and bullet point any reasons you can think of. Okay, so obviously I haven't written my own list because there are many different things that you could um, have got down, but if you have anything down about um, men's ideas and attitudes towards women, so for example, that women were not intelligent enough to vote, women were too emotional, um, it was considered that a woman's place was in the home, a woman um, wasn't allowed to be involved in politics, um, women didn't have high paid or skilled jobs, so men didn't feel as though they deserved the vote, um, politicians were worried about which way women would vote if they were awarded, so politicians were scared to award women the vote, so anything along those reasons give yourself um, a tick. So last um, lesson we were thinking about um, the role of women before World War One so we hadn't quite got to World War One just yet so before we look at women during World War One we'll just recap quickly attitudes and the role of women before war. So before the outbreak of World War One in 1914 middle class and upper class women were seen as being fragile ornaments to be looked after. Their place was in the home, caring for their family. Most working class women did work in a factory, so it is a little bit of a myth that sometimes people assume that women didn't work at all before World War One. That's not true. Um, upper class women tended to not work, but lower class and middle class women did work. So sometimes they uh, would work in a factory, minding spinning or weaving machines. Um, other working class women worked in domestic service, so um, childcare, cleaning, um, sometimes living in house as like a maid or a servant um, but the issue with that was that the pay was really poor and conditions often weren't very good long hours for little money um, and also a lot of women found that they were sacked once they got engaged to be married because of the attitudes towards women was that their first and most important role was to care for their husband and their household so it wasn't seen as being necessary to keep a woman on um, in her job once she was engaged so um, a lot of young women um, who liked to work or needed to work because they needed the money sometimes they they um, would hide their wedding ring because they didn't want their employer to find out that they um, had got married because it would often result in them getting sacked from their job. So again, last lesson, um, we studied the actions of two different groups. We looked at the suffragettes and the suffragists. Both were campaigning uh, to extend, that should be extend, sorry, not extend, um, to extend the franchise to women. So this was a word that we talked about quite a lot last lesson. So if you've forgotten the meaning of the franchise, the franchise was just another term for the right to vote um, and being allowed to vote in elections. Um, 
even though both of these groups were campaigning for the same thing, they campaigned in very different ways. So again, just write the heading suffragette and suffragist for me and anything you can remember from last lesson about the way in which these two groups campaigned, bullet point that now for me, please, as just a quick recap. So pause me now. Suffragettes, suffragists, how did they campaign to extend the right to vote for women? Okay, so we'll start with the suffragists because they came first. Hopefully you've remembered that um, the suffragists were um, the peaceful movement in the campaign for women's votes. Um, they believed in peaceful protest, they believed in um, long-term slow change, that um, gradual change would come, men would realise that women were sensible enough to vote, they would... Um, protest um, in terms of uh, large demonstrations, they would hold signs um, and they believed that change would come gradually over time. They did not believe in um, working or protesting in a, an aggressive way. They thought that that actually did more damage than it did um, good, um, but they believed in slow change over time. And that then gives birth to um, the suffragette movement. Um, so. Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter Christabel had been a part of the suffragist movement run by Millicent Fawcett, but the suffragettes believed that this slow and steady um, push for the vote actually was not working, and they believed in more um, kind of brute force uh, and militancy, so they would... Um, burn down churches, smash windows, they um, would go into museums and slash famous paintings, um, putting um, explosive devices in certain places, um, setting fire to post boxes. Um, there was two attempts uh, to kill the Prime Minister um, by suffragettes as well uh, and also we spoke last lesson about Emily Davidson who um, either accidentally or deliberately threw herself under the King's horse and killed herself um, for the movement. So both groups um, were fighting for the same thing but in a very different way. And I finished the uh, lesson last week um, with this point here. Both groups have been campaigning for several years. However, in August 1914, World War One has broken out and we have become, as a country, involved in World War One. Therefore, when that decision was made, both groups decided to halt their campaigns. They believed that the war effort took precedence over the fight for the vote. That means that they believed that the war was more important and the fight for women to vote needed to be put on hold a little bit because all of their effort and all of their time had to be put towards um, World War I. Um, and ultimately, it was this decision that actually proved crucial because once the war was over um, and the attitudes of women and the hard work of women during World War I, it was that decision that really resulted in eventual change in the law and that led to some women being able to vote in 1918. I keep pressing this point here because this is a mistake that people often make. Um, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2018, um, I remember watching the news and there was um, big celebrations on BBC News that it was a hundred years since women were given the right to vote, and actually that annoyed me a little bit because. In 1918 not all women were given the right to vote it was only some women and then we have to wait a few more years um, for it to be extended further so just bear in mind that 1918 doesn't apply to all women it's just some women but we'll come back to that point um okay hang on is that just the same slide as that one yeah it is delete that ignore me um so we see big changes when World War I breaks out within our country because, um, obviously, men were recruited. Um, they weren't conscripted to start off with, so it was all done on a voluntary basis to start off with. But then by the time we get into 1916 and the government needs more male soldiers, um, 
men were, were forced to join the war and were sent abroad to fight. That means that we have a real lack of men in our country and the jobs still have to keep going. We still need the workers. Um, so to start off with, the government was initially reluctant to let women do the jobs that men would normally have done, but those men had to go abroad to fight and someone's got to do them. So to begin with, women were only able to serve as nurses, cooks, typists um, and volunteers. They were kind of given sort of um, female-ish jobs at the start of World War One, but then over time they proved themselves um, and to keep up with um, sort of munitions productions and factory work, the government was forced to allow women into more traditionally male jobs like bus drivers, farmers, police officers and munitions workers. And it was that change there that had a major shift on male attitudes towards women. This is when they were really able to prove themselves. So this table should be on teams for you to use. I'm going to go through, these are just some of the examples of the many jobs that women did during World War I. We're going to look at the canaries, the land girls, transport and nursing. In this first table here, you're just going to get down some bullet points about what women actually did in that role. Then in this final box here, this is going to take a little bit more thinking. You're going to use this information here from your first column to think about how did this improve the status of women. So how did their role in that particular job prove to men that they were capable and that they were worthy of being awarded the vote? So this second column is going to take a little bit more thinking than this um, first column here. So get this table off Teams, pause me now, find it and have it ready. Then we're going to go through this information together and you can pause me when you need to and you can complete this table as we go through. So the first one, canaries. By 1918 over 900,000 women were working in munitions factories. Munitions work involved the production of shells, weapons and chemicals. Um, so munitions is basically um, weapons, guns, bullets, that kind of thing, anything that needed to be sent abroad to help the men fight. It was dangerous and unhealthy work and the women were nicknamed canaries as the chemicals that they worked with within the factories actually turned the women's skin yellow. Um, it initially starts off by turning the end of your fingertips yellow and then it sort of goes across your whole body. It can change your hair colour as well to like a yellowy blonde. Um, and women who were pregnant and worked in the munitions factories, uh, they gave birth to yellow babies. Um, the skin didn't stay like that over time it became um, a more regular um, colour but it was kind of like a, a luminous yellow which is why they were called canaries because if you've ever seen a canary bird they are bright yellow. Um, munitions workers were battling the shell crisis of 1915 so the shell crisis was um, a, a big issue for um, our country which effectively meant that women had no choice they had to go within the factories and create more shells for the men that were fighting abroad because we were running out of them but that meant that the factories became prime targets for things like enemy fire um, and also enemy bombing as well because the enemy wanted to make sure that that we weren't able to keep producing this weaponry uh, women also risked losing fingers, hands, burns, blindness was also really common as well. Um, in the factories, women would take a shell casing, they'd fill it with explosive powder, then they'd have to put the detonator on top um, and the detonator had to be tapped down. The problem was they had to tap it hard enough to make sure that it went down, but if they tapped it too hard then it would actually detonate and it, and it would go off in their hands. Explosions were a common occurrence, with fatal blasts reported at factories in Ashton-under-Lyme, Barnbow near Leeds and Nottinghamshire. Numerous girls were killed during their service working in munitions factories as canary girls. Um, however, most women did actually like working in the factories, as the pay was significantly higher than jobs that they had been allowed to do before the war, such as domestic service. So women had found their freedom a little bit working within a factory, factory work again was something that this was seen as being a man's world and they were allowed to do work that they'd never been given the opportunity to do before so this has give, had given women a bit of a taste of freedom and they actually really liked it <laughs> 
Next one, again, pause me if I'm going too quickly, just fill in the table at your own pace. Um, land girls. By 1915, Germany's best chance of victory lay in actually starving Britain into surrender through a naval blockade. Um, that meant effectively Germany was bombing um, any ships that were bringing food to our country. So in order to tackle that, we had to become more self-sufficient in food, which meant that we had to grow more of our own food. At the start of war, um, Britain was producing just 35% of the food that it ate. All of the other food came um, via shipping and obviously that was being um, blown up and attacked by the Germans. So we had to start growing and producing more of our own food or we were going to starve to death. Then in 1917, the situation got worse because actually the harvest failed um, and Britain was left with just three weeks worth of food reserves. So we really were in a dire crisis and famine loomed over the country. Um, the Board of Agriculture set up the Women's Land Army and over a quarter of a million volunteers flocked to help. Um, we're going to look at one particular case from a woman called Agnes and she was from Cardiff. She left her um, life and her initial job as a domestic servant um, and went to work at a farm called Green Farm in Cardiff and this is what she said about her experience um, as being a land girl. She said, we had to get up at five in the morning for milking. After that, especially during winter, we'd have to muck out the cow sheds. I'd be there picking up stones from the field or cutting hay. By 1918, there were 20,000 land girls. And she goes on to say, when I became a land girl, I thought, that's it, I'm independent, she said. I had a pound a week, not as much as the men, but it was still a lot. I think the First World War did change women because once they'd had a taste that they wouldn't go back to service, they were free. In 1919, the Women's Land Army was actually disbanded, which means that it was ended because men returned home and they wanted their jobs back within agriculture and also um, imports resumed. So we were able to bring in food um, from other countries, whereas we hadn't during the First World War because Germany kept bombing the ships. So actually the, the Women's Land Army was ended, although it was brought back again during World War II. Next one, transport. One of the areas of employment um, where new opportunities opened up for women was in transport. Uh, women began working as um, bus conductresses, ticket collectors, porters, carriage cleaners and bus drivers. During the war, the number of women working on railways rose from 9,000 to 50,000. By the time, sorry, by the turn of the century, nearly half of the women employed by railway companies worked in hostels and catering. Railway companies uh, began issuing trouser overalls to women, which might seem like a bit of a random point to put in there, but actually this is really important. Um, women were not really allowed to wear trousers. Uh, that's where that expression comes from, who wears the trousers. Trousers were deemed as being for men only. Women were um, in dresses and in skirts. But if you are working... Um, in a practical job, skirts and dresses are not practical um, and they can actually be quite dangerous because the, they sort of float around uh, and they catch in the wind um, and they can kind of like catch on something in a factory um, or if you're working on a railway, again, they could catch on the railway so they were dangerous. So women were actually given trousers to wear for the first time and like, um, you know, like overalls. Um, and this was seen as being a really important step because for the first time, women were dressing like men and were doing the work of men. Um, so it was actually something quite controversial to allow a woman to wear the trousers and that's where... Um, as I said earlier, that's where the, the famous slogan comes from. You can tell she wears the trousers. It means she's the boss, the woman's the boss. Um, roles were traditionally female, like cooks, kitchen assistants, cleaners, housemaids, waitresses. Um, but by 1914, about 900 women also started working in railway workshops as skilled trimmers, polishers, um, sewing machinists and producing um, finely upholstered and polished interiors of railway coaches. So to start off with, they tried to just give women female jobs like cleaning and waitressing, but again, by the time the war starts to develop, they realise that the women have to do the more masculine jobs, such as working um, in railway workshops and factories. 
For so long, work in the railways was seen as men's work, but women played integral role in the rail industry throughout history. And whilst these new jobs did become available to women during wartime, many of these opportunities were closed to them after war as the servicemen returned to their jobs and they wanted their jobs back. So women were pushed out of the railway industry once more as soon as World War One was over and men returned wanting their like traditional roles back. Um, and the last one for you to complete, nursing. This one's quite a big one. At the start of the war, nursing was unregulated, meaning that anybody could call themselves a nurse. Um, so many women offered their services, although a lot of women had very little practical training. So it's not like what we think of a nurse today, where a nurse would have to have qualifications and go to university. As we saw um, a couple of lessons back, that wasn't the case. Women struggled to get formal training in nursing or to become doctors. Um, but this soon changed. Um, women who had no vote at the time were initially not allowed on the front line. So the front line is where the main form of fighting happens during a war. So that's where the most injured men are because that's where, where the battle is essentially. However, this slowly changed as doctors realised that, uh, realized that nurses were key to coping with the volume of soldiers and the complex care needs that these injured men had. Year by year, their roles developed and they worked in many different scenarios, from base hospitals to casualty clearing stations, hospital trains, barges, hospital ships, all across the different war fronts, including working on the Western Front, the Eastern Front and also in the Mediterranean. So women also got the opportunity to travel as well. In the beginning, recruitment was not difficult for both nurses and the voluntary aid detachments, also known as the VADs. The VADs uh, provided nursing assistance, including comforting patients, providing meals, driving ambulances, which again, that was a pretty important one because driving itself was seen as something a man would do. Women were not encouraged to drive, but now they needed the women to drive the ambulances, so they were given more freedom in that respect. The VAD organisation had been running since 1909, so there were many volunteer nurses who were already available and they were wanting to go when World War I broke out. Women were really keen to play their part in the war effort. At the start of the war, the British medical military services were reluctant to take female nurses on because they believed, as we've seen so many times before, that women would not be able to cope during war and they wouldn't be able to cope with the field hospitals. But women were able to prove themselves really quickly and this had a big impact on men's attitudes towards women in medicine. Nurses had to learn a lot of new technical skills, especially in the areas of wound care. For the first time they were seeing multiple wounds, large wounds, infected wounds, all had to be dealt with really carefully. Nurses were also trained in brand new techniques such as blood transfusions and complex surgeries. This is something that they had never been allowed to be involved with previously and they really stepped up to the plate and they proved their worth throughout World War I and attitudes towards nursing dramatically changed as a result. So you should have this table completed now and I've just got one last thing that I want to go over. Um, and then I've got a little clip that I want to direct you towards. So if you are doing this in two parts and you feel like you've done enough already, obviously feel free to pause me and do this last little bit later. But if you just want to carry on, then that's fine. So normally we would stick this sheet in our books, but obviously we can't do that just yet. So I'm going to put it on the screen instead. Um, we're going to read through the different um, sections here, the different stages of the struggle to the vote. What do you think was the key event that helped women to gain the vote when they did? So first of all here, the first hurdle, 1914, First World War breaks out. Suffragists and suffragettes end their political campaigns. They take on men's jobs whilst they're away fighting. This shows the government that they are capable and they are responsible. Then 1916. Voting laws had to be changed when men went off to war so that an election could take place. All men were now allowed to vote. David Lloyd George, who supported women's suffrage, was elected as Prime Minister. So two important things there. We see changes in the voting laws to allow more men to vote. And we see a change in Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, who was more supportive than the previous Prime Minister. And he supported women's suffrage. Next one, 1918. Women over 30 who were householders or wives of householders were given the vote, as were graduates. So this is the first change we see here. 
But as I mentioned earlier, this is not all women. This is just some women. You had to be over the age of 30 and you had to own a household. It was incredibly difficult for women to own property during this time um, unless you had inherited property through the death of your husband um, or you were from a really wealthy estate. You could still vote if your husband owned a household um, but again, this was, was quite limiting. This cut out a lot of women from being able to vote. And you could also vote if you were a graduate. But again, we know that a lot of women were not allowed and were not able to go to university. So even though this is a step in the right direction, it's still not allowing all women to vote. And then finally, the last hurdle here, another 10 years later, 1928, all women over the age of 21 were given the vote in um, a, like a similar situation to men. So in 1915, the government realised that there was a serious flaw with the voting system and that thousands of soldiers who had been abroad fighting in World War I would no longer to be eligible uh, to vote once they'd returned home. There was a loophole in the law that said that if you had been out of the country for a certain amount of time, that you were not able to vote. So the government were in the process of changing this law for men. The women of Britain saw this as their opportunity to push for change and they put pressure on the government to include women in the new voting law for men. They thought, well, if you're going to change voting laws for men, you might as well change voting laws for women whilst you're at it. And you can see this here, this coin is representing that. 1918, the Representation of the People's Act, which is what it was dubbed as, which was the first step in allowing women to vote. Therefore, World War I was the most important reason as to why women were able to gain the vote when they did. But as you can see here, yes, it is the outbreak of World War I, but it's also the change in attitudes that we start to see over time. The attitude of the suffragettes and the suffragists, the roles of work that women took on during war, the new prime minister who was a supporter of women's suffrage. So had these smaller events not taken place, this would have been a much slower process. Okay, so last thing, if you go um, onto YouTube and find um, the Great War series, they always look like this. They have the little Great War slogan in the, bottle, uh, in the bottom and then they have um, the little caption at the side. They're created by someone called Indy Nidell um, and he's, he's really good, particularly with World War One. So if you've found um, the World War One inf information interesting and want to watch a little bit more, if you type in the Great War Women, it'll come up with this clip here. I think it's about 10 minutes long and it'll give you a little bit more um, information uh, about women at war and there's loads down this side here um, with more information um, about World War One, and you can find more information about women at war as well so if you wanted to that's a little bit of an extra um clip that you can watch okay so that is it from me um thank you very much for listening again and as i've said there's not going to be another youtube lesson next week instead um there'll be a quiz for you to complete